it's, it's on. Can you hear me? All right, fantastic. Who's ready to celebrate? Man, it is wonderful to be here and to be able to welcome everybody to celebrate invention. Um, there's just so much like good vibes and energy in the room today, and it's it's great to see so many familiar faces and um, to hopefully meet some meet some new folks. I'm Kelly Sexton. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research and Innovation Partnerships, and I'm thrilled to kick off Celebrate Invention. This event provides us with a chance to get together, to network, and to celebrate the University of Michigan's incredible community of innovators. The University of Michigan's reputation as a global leader for innovation, commercialization, and positive economic, societal, and patient impact can be attributed to the um, success, the dedication, and the brilliance of University of Michigan faculty and staff who are constantly pushing the boundaries of knowledge and technology, working tirelessly to ensure that their discoveries have the very best chance to change the world. It is with this thought of ingenuity and of showcasing and celebrating success that the Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award was created. This award recognizes University of Michigan faculty who have developed transformative ideas and helped bring them to the marketplace for broad societal impact. This year's recipients of the Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award, the Histotripsy team, exemplify this spirit and they will be formally receiving their award from um, Vice President for Research, Rebecca Cunningham, later this afternoon. For now, it is with great pleasure that, that I kick off and introduce um, this afternoon's panel discussion. First, we will be hearing remarks from Professor Jen Xu, Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Lead Investigator for the Histotripsy team. Jen is going to share with us an overview of the original creation of Histotripsy and the team's research and commercialization efforts. Immediately following her remarks, we're going to move to a panel discussion to talk more about the journey of histotripsy and the future of this really exciting technology. So please join me in welcoming Professor Xu to the stage. Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first I wonder, on behalf of the team, thank the Innovation Partnerships for this prestigious award. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure for me to present on behalf of team our journey to take this innovative technology, histotripsy, the, uh, our road of 20 years journey for non-invasive cancer treatment from discovery to the clinic. And I also want to thank you all to be here to celebrate together uh, of this wonderful journey. To start with, and then you see, what you see here is a panel of the recipients of this year's uh, Innovator Award, uh, including me and the Dr. Tim Hall, Brian Fox, Will Roberts, and Jonathan Sukovich. And I do want to dedicate the award to Dr. Charles Kane, who was my PhD mentor and the leader of his Tripsy team before he passed away in 2020. So, Really, when I was asked to give this presentation uh, about our journey to take this technology all the way from bench to clinic, we're talking about over 20 years of journey this, you know, instilled into this 10-minute uh, presentation. And I will do my best <laughs> to, to give you an overview. Um, so things started in 2001, and I still remember that moment. And in 2001, uh, Dr. Ahi Ludomirsky, who was a ca pediatric cardiologist, and came to Charles' office and asked Charles and me a question. And he asked, can you invent a non-invasive intervention technology that can perform the real surgery? So what he meant was the real surgery, not just heating the tissue with uh, uh, different energy source like radio frequency or microwave or even ultrasound, and not ionization like radiation th therapy. 
is something that can mechanical break tissue down and perform tissue removal just like a surgery. And that's very, very important for him as a cardiologist for cardiac surgeries. But can we do this without opening the patient up in an entirely non-invasive fashion? And that's what really motivated this whole uh, process of invention and development of histotripsy. So I also want to take you back this years ago, 2002, and this is literally one of the first movies uh, of showing the histotripsy when we first discovered it. So this is a video where you see here is actually a, a pig heart tissue. So it's a piece of pig heart tissue that I got from the slaughterhouse. <laughs> Uh, and the ultrasound device is placed in this water tank about 10 centimeters away and then focused to a region here. So what you will see is this video in real time. Oh, let me see if I can get it play. All right, so what you are here seeing what I saw over 20 years ago, we turn on the ultrasound and we, I start to see this actually with this very specialized ultrasound parameters for the first time. I see there's tissue particle like debris, almost like smoke coming out of this region. And this is in real time, okay? There's no sound effect, but in, there was actually sound. Uh, and then really within a minute, what I saw was with this ultrasound device placed 10 centimeters away, uh, well-confined perforation of about a millimeter in size was actually created through this pig cardiac tissue. And I have to tell you, I could not believe my eyes. So the first thing I saw it, I was like, is it really real? I had to do it. You saw the three holes here? I did it three times before I thought I was not crazy. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so that was the first phenomenon that we observed. Uh, and what also come from that observation is that the specialized parameters that you know, were used to create this was microseconds ultrasound pulses at really, really high pressure. Uh, we are talking about you know, over 100 times of atmosphere. So that requires specialized equipment. And you can see here, this is you know, not a picture taken 20 years ago. I, I didn't take a lot of pictures so when we started the process. So back, uh, but then later, uh, I took a picture of this, but this is the amplifier, almost as big as a person, used to drive one channel transducer in order to produce the effect, a histotripsy phenomenon you saw just now. Uh, and it was, you know, it, it was driven by 380 volts. Uh, and this is, you know, over the years, our team really focused on developing very specialized equipment. And what you see here is actually an eight-channel amplifier that does eight times and more, give more voltage compared to this one big thing, and it can place on your palm. Um, and this is just one of the examples of really what we have to do to push this into potentially commercialization and translation. And on the right here, also show you a picture. So this is the initial transducer we used to do the experiment to perforate the cardiac tissue from the pig. And this is one channel. And the picture here is our latest 260 element array that can do all kinds of fancy things from treatment to at really fast speed, going through ribs, and also do monitoring as well, where uh, Dr. Tim Hall and Johnson Sukovic really uh, had made significant contribution. So another thing is, uh, you know, we always tell people, hey, we are scientists, we know what we are doing. The reality is that when we first had a phenomenon observation, we had no clue. Okay, so we spent another 10 years afterwards to understand what was really going on and how ultrasound could be used to precisely control uh, and for tissue perforation, you know, mechanical tissue disruption and all the other effects. Uh, so this is a video that was taken by my former student, Eli Vivlasovic, uh, but also is a really a great collaboration with Brian Fox, uh, uh, Adam Maxwell, Charles loved this stuff. Uh, so what you are seeing here is that the ultrasound delivered from outside the body actually focus into the tissue with millimeter accuracy. Then it actually activates the nanometer gas pockets that's already in our body because we are breathing air. 
and it actually activates that and form microbubbles. So what you see here, the dark structure here, are several microbubbles coalesced into this one big bubble, and then expand and collapse all within 100 microseconds in this movie, so it's taken with a super uh, high-speed camera. And what the white structures are, are breast cancer cells. So you can see that when the bubble expands, the breast cancer cells get squished. And when the bubble collapses, the breast cancer cell get actually pulled apart. It's really this local mechanical stress and strain that mechanically bisect the cells and disrupt the cells. So we actually do have a scalpel, but this scalpel is microbubbles on the size order of the cells and controlled with invisible and very safe ultrasound. In 2010, after we understood how it worked, we think we have handle on the uh, equipment, uh, Histosonics was funded. And this picture actually showed the, the first, uh, I remember it was this long Chad Carson's and we have all the co-founders in this picture, other than Brian Fox because he was taking pictures. <laughs> um, so then we have Tim, uh, we have Will and Charles and me. And then also those are the scientific founders from the university side. And then um, we have also uh, Tom Davidson, the first CEO of Histosonics, uh, Chris Gibbons, uh, the first CFO, and also the second CEO of the company, and also Jim Berchlina, the first CTO of the company. Uh, so, you know, people now talk about uh, instant success of Histosonics overnight. Um, the reality is actually has been around for over 10 years with a lot of up and downs. So we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, so the first clinical application and the first human trial was actually in prostate. So this is uh, uh, showing a video of the early experiments that Will Roberts and uh, uh, Tim Hall did in the canine prostate with the indication to treat benign prostatic hypoplasia, BPH, where uh, most men will get at an older age and where the enlarged prostate really compress onto the urethra and causing urination difficulty. And we thought, oh, we can use histotripsy to break up the prostate tissue then release the pressure uh, to treat BPH and the uh, preclinical experiments in the animals was beautiful. Uh, and I do want to show the video because it's a very typical video. What you see here is those uh, microbubbles are bright dancing uh, structures, right? So they are this uh, uh, bright dancing bubble cloud that you can visualize really clearly on ultrasound imaging in real time, and which is extremely important because for non-invasive surgery, typically the clinician cannot open up the patient, so they cannot see what's going on. But here, what's the difference here is that the clinician can see exactly what they are doing, their invisible uh, sound scalpel producing these microbubbles visible on ultrasound imaging very clearly in real time. And after treatment, the black zone here actually show the successful treatment effect uh, demonstrating by this mechanical breakdown of the tissue that reducing the sound scatters. So, so it was great. And there was a human trial, phase one, in 2016, uh, in 25 patients in the United States. Uh, however, that treatment uh, results coming from the safety trial was mixed. Uh, and after that, uh, it didn't, the company decided not to pursue the prostate for that time and started to switch focus to cancer treatment. Uh, and the first indication for the cancer treatment uh, was liver cancer. And I'm showing the, some of the one of the many, many studies we did for liver cancer treatment. And this is actually uh, by Tejus W. Walliker. Uh, and we did experiments in the orthotopic liver tumor model in the rats, where you can see that the tumors in the rat liver, they spontaneously metastasize all over the liver within two to three weeks without treatment. And while when we treat with histotripsy, we treat at day seven, right? before the metastasis going crazy. Uh, and we treat about 50 to 75% of the liver tumor. And what you can see that within two to three weeks, the tumor entirely gone. Nine of the 11 rats had a tumor-free survival. The other rats also had a prolonged survival. Uh, and really no metastasis, even the re residual tumor were gone. 
Uh, so with a lot of preclinical study, it, we in, uh, Hisasonics actually initiated this uh, phase one trial in Barcelona in 2019, and it's led by Dr. Vidal Jove. Uh, this is the first hysteropsy cancer treatment and with indication of primary and metastatic uh, liver tumors. So we treated eight patients with 11 tumors, and 10 of the 11 tumors were successfully treated with a regression observed at the two-month follow-up by MRI. Uh, so this is actually, uh, you can see here that the tumor here, and this is a tumor I want to emphasize too, is a tumor right on the hepatic vein. So there's a vein actually here is seen nicely here. Uh, then histotripsy was used to treat the entire tumor with a margin where the hepatic vein right there is intact. And then two months later, you definitely see the regression. So the tumor treated, unlike when you use heating, you just sit there and stay there. Histotripsy really is like a surgery. It's actually shrinking and eventually all the debris absorbed by the body. Uh, and also it can be used to treat uh, nearby very high risk locations. So uh, critical structures like uh, vascular bundles, or bile ducts, they remain intact. So this not only allows us to perform surgery non-invasively, it can also allow us to perform surgery at regions where uh, the current approach cannot do because of the high risks. Uh, one thing that's super exciting from uh, that trial, and also we have preclinical study to show, is that uh, histotripsy actually stimulates this really potent immune response, not just locally, but systemically. And in the patient results, uh, in two of those eight patients treated, we only treated one to three tumors in those uh, patients. However, we observed in those two patients a global biomarker uh, reduction. So this is one patient with a colorectal metastasis into the liver where the tumor was treated uh, outside actually this MRI slice. But you can see this on the MRI slice that at eight weeks, the tumor metastasis that were not treated actually substantially reduced. Uh, and this is uh, determined as a scopal effect. So 2021 um, and new leadership <laughs> then even, even, the, even the three of us is excited in this one. Yeah. I told you I understand that. Is it a connection? Must be. She didn't talk to me. I, I didn't. The global up is not invasive too, but you can. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the reality behind success stories, and so I think oh, the challenges along the way. Yeah, here we go. Technical issue. It happens all the time. We encounter in engineering school. So, okay. Um, yeah, so 2021, new leadership. So this is a new CEO, Mike Blue, and uh, Josh Stopak is a new CTO, and this is a new Histotripsy system, Edison platform by Histosonics. Really cool. Um, Histosonics has a booth here with some cool video to show. I encourage you to see. But really, in short, it's a platform where you have ultrasound imaging, right? So it looks like ultrasound imaging car, and it has a robot arm here with six degree of movement with a Histotripsy transducer at the end and imaging probe, ultrasound imaging probe in the middle. So this is a platform that's so compact, but it has histotripsy treatment, monitoring of real-time ultrasound imaging, robot arm, and uh, very user-friendly treatment planning and monitoring software, all in this platform that the clinician can easily wheel this in and out of the operation room for non-invasive surgery. And we even envision in the future it can be used in the clinic uh, as well. Um, and um, I do want to, you know, do a couple of things on this slide. One is that 2021 uh, Hope for Liver multicenter clinical trial was started in 14 sites in the United States and Europe, which is a great, great thing. Um, but I do want to shout out to many, many people here actually made this trial possible and a success. Uh, one is the Histosonics technical team, uh, John Kanacha, Ryan Miller, and the Alex Turing here, and all the, uh, the technical team here really making, really the team behind the system. Also, a number of clinicians, and I can't name them all, I and mean, I'm only showing a few pictures here. Uh, so Dr. Cliff Cho and Dr. 
uh, Tim Zium Wallace, they are the co national co PI of this trial. Uh, Dr. Fred Lee also really uh, important, play an important role, and Joe Emerald, and especially Michelle Lala. I want to really uh, mention that she is a local PI at University of Michigan Hospital for this Hopo Liver trial, and she treated the most number of patients within this trial. Um, and really just in short, like our 20 years journey, uh, we, uh, you know, highlighting things that hopeful liver trial completed. All the data has been submitted by Hisasonic to the FDA. So Hisasonic so far has not heard any uh, complaints or any negative feedback from FDA, and we are hoping to get FDA clearance very, very soon. Uh, Hisasonic started the histotripsy trial on renal tumor in the UK and named after Charles King, the King trial. Uh, and uh, we are hoping to start the histotripsy pancreatic tumor trial and the immunotherapy combination trial. Actually, really, uh, Cliff Cho's uh, work on this is phenomenal and hopefully soon. And also, Hisasonic so far, uh, I, ta I had a talk with them um, just two weeks ago. They hired their 100th employee just two weeks ago uh, and uh, raised over $200 million, uh, had got the FDA breakthrough device indication, a number of things, which I really didn't think it was possible when 20 years ago we discovered this phenomenon. Um, but really, by the end, I want to say that it takes a village. It does, really, truly. Not a village, maybe, you know, whole army. Um, we <laughs> to do the translation. So, uh, so I want to acknowledge a number of people, and I apologize if I don't mention your name, but uh, our um, Histotripsy lab uh, with our PhD student postdoc staff. Uh, we have so many collaborators from engineering school to medic school. Many people I didn't have time to mention. I did Pandi, Doc No, Sandra, Niraj, Maggie, uh, Mike Green, and Jia Qi, Gabe, and all those people. A uh, lot of funding from NIH and other resources, and and beyond just you know Michigan, uh, we have a lot of collaborators. Uh, all the Hisasonics team, uh, and you know other institutions, University of Wisconsin, Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm just really grateful uh, for the opportunity being able to work with all those people on uh, this uh, histotripsy technology. So this is our first histotripsy summit that was uh, uh, 2019. Uh, in here we had in Arbor, and they, last year we had this again, just family of friends thing for histotripsy, and we already have like almost 200 people, so it's growing really quickly. Uh, so by the end, just thank you all for being here, and I thank everybody who had uh, contributed to the histotripsy development, uh, and really it's a group effort. I'm just really feeling grateful and fortunate to be here on behalf of a team to accept this award. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Jen. Um, so at this moment, we're gonna transition to our panel discussion. So if our panelists could please come up and have a seat. We're gonna um, continue to discuss the journey of histotripsy from the lab to um, a product that's being tested in the clinic, so thank you. was a great overview. Um, so I, don't you guys just love science? Like I, I loved seeing the pictures of you in the lab, you know, working in the equipment. And I'm sure some of those were taken at like 11 o'clock at night um, when you were exhausted. And, and some of those may have been before we even had, you know, cell phones to take quick photos with. But so, you know, 20 years ago when, you know, you first had this observation and, and you had to, you know, repeat it three times just to convince yourself that, you know, you weren't crazy. It, kind of at, at what moment did you realize that you had developed a technology um, that could really transform um, the way we think about surgery and removal of diseased tissue? Like, was it, was it then? Did that realization come later in discussions with clinicians? And how did that feel? So definitely not 2002, I'll to cover the phenomenon, as I Make sure this is true and I'm not crazy. Um, but what the realization came, um, it was actually interesting because after that, we started making presentation at the uh, national and international scientific conferences and some clinical conferences. And I can tell you for the next five to almost 10 years, uh, people wouldn't believe it. 
uh, the question I get at the conference is not how did you do this with some technical question. It's the question to start with, this is not possible. And, and, uh, um, and Charles and I talk about it, and Charles said, you know, when so many people, including the leader in the field, make an effort to tell you it's impossible, this meaning that we are on the verge of a breakthrough. And I believed him, and we kept pushing. So the funny thing is I thought, uh, I really started to believe that it can be a big deal because many, many people, I cannot tell you how many, from Dean, from you know, like leading scientists in the field, and even asking question if this is successful, what um, and, and from that, I started to realize that this can actually make a big impact, scientifically and clinically. Thank you. Um, so, Jim, this next, oh, I forgot to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. I'm sorry. I'm so excited about this story and the technology. If you can't tell, I'm kind of geeking out. So if, if you would forgive me, folks. Um, can we start with, you've met Jim. Jim, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. I'm Jim Maddox. I'm the Executive Managing Director of Venture Investors Health Fund. We're a venture capital fund that invests in early stage healthcare companies, including many U of M spin outs. And I'm also fortunate to be the lead investor in Histosonics and the chairman. Thank you. Um, so Vikas, if you could introduce yourself next, please. Right, so <clears throat> I'm Vikas Gulani. I'm the chair of radiology here, a group of people who gets paid to look at and use pictures. Thank you. Ganesh? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ganesh Palapatu. I'm the chair of the Department of Urology here at the University of Michigan. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, so, Jim, the, the next question is for you. So, I don't think you've ever told me the story, and I'm, I'm like, really curious to know. Um, could you walk us through your involvement with the team? And I'm really interested in how did you first come to hear of the technology? How did you meet the scientific team? And, you know, what's your involvement been over the years in, you know, s supporting the, the team from the journey of the technology, formation of the startup, and then your role today with um, the startup company, Histosonics? Sure. Um, first, I want to say, though, Jen, how you talked about how all your, the scientific people said, oh, it's not possible, not possible. 10 times as many investors said it was impossible <laughs> along the way. So it's not just the scientists. Um, yeah, so I, you know, being a venture capitalist, you know, walk the halls and, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, graduate the university. And so, you know, I started hearing about this research going on and ultrasound and histotripsy and, and how they had taken something called cavitation, which I was familiar with, that everybody was trying to avoid, and they figured out how to harness it. I was like, hmm, that sounds kind of cool. And then I started meeting with Charles and Jen and the team, and, and then doing, you know, really seeing, you know, going in the lab and seeing the demos. Like, for me, it's all about the demos. And, and that was back in 2008. So, you know, along Jen's timeline, it's 2023 now. So a long time ago, and we invested in 2009. Venture investors led the, the Series A that started out at first. I couldn't find anybody to co-invest with me. And then by the end, we actually had to turn people away. We had people slowly built up momentum and raised $15 million in, um, in 2009 when we closed. And you know, then we started building a company. You know, Chris Gibbons that, that Jen mentioned was an executive in residence with our firm, so she joined the team with Tom Davison on the kind of the management side of the team. And, and then we you know, the, went to work on BPH, and you know, Will Roberts is sitting here, he was leading the BPH effort, being a urologist. And, and you know, that's really when, when it started. And you know, then we led a Series B, really not for, until 2017. And things had really slowed down. We, we had a hard time just kind of proving it out, and we did the BP-8 study, and it was proven safe, which was really important. But, it, you know, we didn't hit the end clinical endpoints. And, you know, that was when, oh, thank you. And, um, you know, at that point is when we had to pivot, and that's when we switched to um, treating cancer, liver cancer. And that was with a lot of input and kind of late night, candid, honest input from Dr. Joe Amaral, who at the time was working at J&J. &J. 
And I was like, how come you guys aren't investing? We need you to invest. And he's like, we don't want BPH. The results aren't there. We really want liver. And can you guys do liver? And I remember the next day we had a board meeting and said, can we do liver? And that's when the team said, I think we can. And you know, that really changed the, the course of the company. And you know, there's a lot of people here that I want to recognize now before I forget. Because you can see there's a long journey. And a lot of these early people, like John Kanata, Jelko, Alex, Ryan, um, Dan, Alexandra, um, these are people that are all behind the scenes that were working you know, inside the company on histotripsy because Jen was doing the research, but at some point it's got to get developed into a product, like into that cart that can then be wheeled into clinical trial sites and hospitals. So I want to really thank that team. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so Vikas, this next question is for you. So you know, you're, the, you're the chair of radiology and there's actually a lot of connections between the, the histosonics technology, um, the histotripsy technology and, and your department. So one, you have a faculty member, um, Brian Falks, who's um, an inventor on the technology. Um, but you were also the, the host for the Hope for Liver clinical trial. Um, your department participated in that. Um, and one of your faculty members, Michelle Lala, actually treated more patients um, in that clinical trial than any other clinician that participated. Um, so I'd love to hear your perspective on how you could envision this technology being used by your department and by others around the country and how you could envision it being used for the patients that, um, that you see and that you treat. Yeah, so, um, I mean, right now, immediately, we can see that uh, both primary and secondary, i.e. metastatic liver tumors can be treated with this. So there's two kinds of primary liver tumors, hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma. And then there's metastatic disease to the liver. It's one of the most common organs that, that metastatic, metastatic disease goes to. So that's the immediate, but you, really, you could ablate any neoplasm that, that you are looking at. So that you could be looking at kidneys. Um, a couple of faculty members in our department are looking at both soft tissue and bone uh, uh, musculoskeletal tumors. So Steve Solomon and uh, Gunjan Malhotra are embarking on working with Jen on this, uh, on this issue. But they also are looking at benign disease, i.e. they're looking at tendons that are inflamed. Could you start treating those? And so they're, they're starting to explore that. So, you know, in, in imaging, we uh, think of imaging as uh, anything that we can treat non-invasively, we will do it. So uh, the tumors are a first step, and they are a first step because, first of all, oftentimes this is a group of people that really needs help very immediately. And you can test the technology and get going on it where some improvement in life is immediately meaningful. But then you start to look at other diseases that may be not as uh, pressing, life-threatening, like tendonitis, uh, but important um, and really debilitating to people. So I think that this is a start of a discussion, not, not the end-all, be-all, but really where can you take a technology like this into the future? Great, thank you. So, um, Ganesh, you know, so for you, so you're chair of urology, and, you know, similarly, there's a lot of points of connection. Of course, we've got William Roberts, um, um, one of the original inventors who's being honored today as faculty in your department, and as well, um, Timothy Hall was actually a postdoc in Professor Roberts' laboratory before joining biomedical engineering. Um, so, a lot of points of connection there. And um, Histosonics recently commenced um, the Kane trial, um, named in honor of the original inventor and, and Jen, of course, your, your mentor, um, Charles Kane. Um, and this phase one study is going to evaluate the safety and efficacy of histotripsy in destroying kidney tumors. Um, so knowing that and recognizing the trial is still ongoing, um, what are some of the ways that you could envision um, your department continuing to participate, other urologists, other applications, and how you can think about um, you know, where the science is going and how that might impact how you treat patients? Great. Thank you for the question. I'd first like to 
really give a lot of gratitude to our faculty member in neurology, Will Roberts. Uh, of course, without him, I wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, it, it was really his idea and working with the collaborators to really the clinical translation of this technology, of, as you said earlier, harnessing the capitation um, bubble activity phenomenon that occurs to really ablate tissue, particularly in the prostate, as Will has tremendous amount of background in physics and biomedical engineering prior. Uh, I think for urology, the the applications are potentially boundless. You have both benign as well as uh, oncologic kind of diseases one can think about. Not only kidney tumors, um, you can imagine there are uh, still coming back to uh, BPH and lower urinary tract symptoms and one can still harness this technology to improve the efficacy. That was really the first model. I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Uh, even uh, other diseases like erectile dysfunction, there's a shockwave lithotripsy is being used for that. And of course, kidney stones, to, to burst kidney stones, something that's near and dear to Dr. Robert's heart, which is another area of his clinical expertise. But I, I do think uh, in many ways this, is, this example of histosonics and histotripsy is really illustrative of really what makes the University of Michigan exceptional, where you have technology, uh, scientists, basic scientists, really coming together with trans, pay, pay, individuals with clinical uh, experience and exposure, but also um, scientific background like Will and others to really bring this technology to clinical applications. So it's not just a science experiment, but really how can we leverage this to transform care and help the world? So in urology, I think there are a multitude of options, but I think I'm even thinking beyond urology as uh, as Vikas alluded to, you have heart disease, you have brain tumors. I know you've all been working with neurosurgery, cardiac arrhythmias in terms of ablating aberrant circuits. Uh, there's a number of different, I think, applications for this technology. And seeing from your slideshow earlier, Jen, about how originally the, it started off as one giant machine and now it's in your palm of your hand, one only can imagine as applications and everything else evolves what other miniaturization as well as scaling could be done to in, ensure that we can deliver this technology in the best way to the places that need to be tested. So I think there's a multitude of options and the upsculpal potential immunological effects of this technology in particular is synergistically with a number of now, uh, you know, immuno-oncology agents of PD-L1, PD-1 and um, checkpoint blockade inhibitors is really interesting, particularly in kidney cancer and bladder cancer. And it's, one might imagine there's some priming effect that can go on when one treats these pr one tumor that it might help uh, treat other tumors. So short answer is lots of stuff to do and maybe the fun has just begun. Yeah, thank you for that. So there's a, there are a couple of threads I wanna pick at there. So, so one being kind of having the infrastructure to encourage collaboration between basic scientists and clinicians. Um, but you also hit on something really interesting talking about the immunological impacts of the technology. So, so Jim, I'm actually gonna kick it to you. Could you give us a layman's description of this um, immunological effect that's being seen with the technology, which I think is something that wasn't anticipated, um, but is looking to open up even more applications for the technology? Sure. Um, you know, interestingly, just to go back a little bit, what people were really afraid of with histotripsy, like really smart people, that it was going to spread the cancer. Like you're, you're ablating it and you're spreading it all throughout the body. And we and everybody, the people involved, we spent a couple of years turning that around, saying, no, we're not. We did studies and we proved it. So that was the starting point with the technology. And then what we started to see, as Jen briefly touched on in her presentation, we started seeing what's called the abscopal effect, which is basically, say, you know, they, they did it in mice, but we also saw in humans, you know, a mouse has two implanted tumors, one on the left side, one on the right side. You only treat one, and the tumor is gone. We can, we, you know, we visibly see it's gone on imaging. But then they started noticing, hey, the other tumor that we did not treat is shrinking. And that got everyone really thinking, like, holy cow. And Cliff Cho, I don't know if Cliff is here, um, but Cliff really started doing a lot of research here at the university on that. And his, his data and Cliff's presentation of the data is just fantastic and really started convincing us, like, wow, not only can this ablate the tumor, so get rid of the tumor, but it might have kind of a systemic effect of basically unmasking the cancer. The cancer is really good at hiding from the body's immune system. That we believe that histotripsy was unmasking it and then the and enabling the body's natural immune system to then attack the cancer tumors. And you know, it's just like you hear of like Merck's Keytruda drug that does this with a drug. Merck 
I think last year sold $22 billion worth of Keytruda. And it only works on 20 to 30 percent of the patients and, and just a number of kind of um, approved cancers. So that's, that's like, wow, what if what we saw, you know, observationally in the studies, what if that works with histotripsy? Then this will be the biggest invention in cancer in the last 50 years. Yeah, it's, it's so exciting. Um, and so exciting that we're here to be able to talk about it and tell the story. Thank you for that. So, so the other thing that was kind of brought up was like having the, the infrastructure and the ways to bring the basic scientists together with the clinicians. And one way that we do that at U of M is through our biomedical engineering department. So we actually have a department that is joint between our College of Engineering and Michigan Medicine. And so there's, there's a lot of connections to that department. Um, one is that three of the original inventors and our awardees today are faculty in this department, of course. Um, Jen, Jonathan Sukovich, and Timothy Hall are all faculty in biomedical engineering. Um, within biomedical engineering, there's an um, important translational research program called the Coulter um, Program that supports um, translational research funding and um, strategy support for med tech projects. And I believe um, the histosonics, um, the histotripsy technology was, um, the Coulter Foundation was an early believer in you and provided critical funding and guidance in, in the very early days when you were still hearing that um, you were crazy and this couldn't possibly be, be true from a lot of people. So, so there's a lot of ways that we have this um, infrastructure and support. So um, Jen, I, I wondered if you could talk about um, you know, the importance, it kind of expand on the importance of this collaboration between Michigan Medicine, between our engineers and our, our basic scientists, and the ways that you've seen it be instrumental in the success of um, the histotripsy journey. Yeah, no, thank you for raising that because uh, it's true, the key of our story really is the collaboration between the engineering school and the medical school. That, that is the key. Uh, and I, you know, this is a Michigan story through and through, right? We invented here, we develop here, we commercialize here. And the reason is Michigan has a top engineering school and top medical school. And we are fortunate to take advantage of it. And I'm hoping more people can take advantage of, of this. And the BME uh, allows us to do that. It's a department, really, like you said, a joint department between the two sides uh, and uh, making that bridge. And I certainly have to thank our department for all the opportunities. Uh, but, but really, like the collaboration, why is it key? Uh, for example, Jim mentioned, you know, you guys mentioned the immunostimulation effects. Uh, we saw the effects, we treated, you know, half of tumor, the other half of tumor is gone. We don't understand it. I have no clue. I don't have the basic immunology knowledge. But Cliff told us, and, and you know, I was able to talk to him. We have many meetings and design experiments together and do the experiments together, really going down that. Uh, another example uh, for liver cancer treatment, we had Michelle Lal and Maggie Zhang really come to the lab doing, they are imaging the mice and rats and the pigs and doing the experiments with us. I mean, Will was really early on is the one that you showed that, you know, were doing all those uh, 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 animal model experiments and, and Will and Tim work really close together. So, so really, I think this is uh, only made possible because of the engineering school and the medical school collaboration. Uh, and and I, like I said, I think it's a unique advantage of Michigan. Yeah. I'd agree. Um, so, so Jen, this, this next one's for you. Um, so we find within innovation partnerships, um, one of our, um, one of the conversations we often have with inventors is how um, the technology is, is vital and important, but it is one component of what's going to ultimately make a successful startup company um, and a successful business. So we, we've kind of touched on this through um, both uh, Jen's presentation and through the discussion, but um, I'm guessing there were some dark moments along the way, um, you know, such as when the clinical trial didn't quite hit the outcomes you were hoping for, um, where you thought this just might not work. And I wondered if you could kind of expand on some of those. Um, and, you know, because I, I think it's important as we celebrate innovation and, and celebrate um, the success of our startups, um, we should also, you know, be open about some of the challenges. So how did you keep going? How did you motivate yourself? How did you motivate the team to keep going? 
Sure. Uh, I could I could answer that in about half an hour, but I think we have <laughs> one minute. So I'll just say, you know, over the, let's see, 2009, so, you know, 14 years now, it, it was a roller coaster. There was a lot of ups and downs, and, and there, you know, the, the company was within weeks of running out of money. I mean, literally. And, you know, I have to give a, a big shout out to the team that I mentioned. Why well, I wanted to make sure I talked about kind of the unsung heroes out in the company was they kept at it. They kept working just like Jen did inside the university with her team. And they, there was always something for me to have faith in. Like it could be, you know, even the early BPH, while we didn't achieve the results, we could see the, we could see the ablation. Um, some of the immune, immunological effects gave hope, like, wow, if that works. So I really hung on to not the 10 things that didn't work, but the one big thing of if that worked, this is going to be great. It's going to change how patients are treated. And a lot of that came down to the team. Again, the team here, the team in the university, team at Tech Transfer. You know, we were missing milestones left and right in the license. And, you know, you're like, hey, I know you're working hard. We'll extend that. You know, Coulter was really important at the beginning because I said no a couple times, and one of them was because of IP. Coulter put the money where their mouth was and said, hey, we'll fund $50,000 of IP work to get over the hump. And then they convinced us, oh, okay, there's good IP here. The uh, mentor in residence program, I think, hired Tom Davison, the first CEO. The MVCA helped pay for Chris Gibbons' salary when she was uh, with um, Venture Investors. Uh, Mint was one of the early investors, you know, University of Michigan program. So, you know, it really was a big collaboration, you know, engineering, tech transfer, the Michigan medicine, and, and all the people involved. And there was always that little bit of good data that kept me going. And, you know, I had to twist some arms with investors to get them to invest. And, and then, you know, then we hired Mike Blue. That was something that was really kind of the the commercial team, and really, you know, now it, it, it's exciting. I was really hoping that we could announce the FDA clearance today. I mean, that's how close we are to having this cleared. Um, you know, there is literally at the senior levels at the FDA waiting for sign-off. And hopefully sometime in the next week or two, you'll have that, we'll have that, we can start treating patients, you know, at Michigan and, and around the world, and customers are lined up. Like, we have more, we're not allowed to have orders now, but we have more letters of intent than we have capacity to build these systems in the near term. So now everybody sees how great this is. And like I said, people are lined up and literally like, okay, well, we'll get you our money first. We'll buy two if we can be the first one. And, and so it's super exciting. And I want to thank everyone here, thank the team, Jen. Jen has been the dynamo in the, you know, inside the university, just making stuff happen, these collaborations happen. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. So I, I was so um, happy and honored when Vikas and Ganesh accepted the, the invitation to participate today because they are two of the busiest people I know. They both oversee, um, you know, very large and, and important divisions. Um, but in addition to being department chairs and physician scientists, they are both also active inventors. Um, so maybe because if you could um, speak first and kind of tell us, you know, why for you, you think it's important for the University of Michigan to support our faculty inventors and how you go about creating that um, culture within your department, within your role. Yeah, so, um, you know, back in the start of my career, I think I was a little naive about all of this and I, was, had this purist view that we shouldn't be doing uh, tech transfer. And so you were a convert then. Okay. I, and, and then I realized that over the course of your life, you can reach N patients, whatever that N is in your, in your life, and that's it. And if you're going to reach more patients than that, you need help from industry. And in order to get into industry, you need to protect the IP. And this is, you know, the, the, I had to grow past my own naivete to understand that if I really want to reach patients, I want to actually have the IP there. And I think that this is a process that uh, is really important both in the medical school and engineering school 
and, and for these schools to collaborate on these technologies, play ping pong with each other, here's an idea, here's how we use it, let's go back and improve it. And so I think that this is a really critical thing that's going on here, and it's super important. I think that the invention cannot get to my patients unless there's a, a company in the middle that has gone through FDA clearance and brought it to market, et cetera, et cetera, and really help patients. So this is a culture that I'm trying to inculcate into the department as well, that you know it, it's, it's really important to think about what's not there in your practice, really, really important. And when you identify it, try to go solve that problem, form a team, go find people in the engineering school, go find people within the medical school that can work, and then uh, protect that IP, bring it to, uh, to fruition in patients. Uh, it's the National Institutes of Health, and it's the health part. How do you get it to that point? And it requires a little bit scale up uh, that we can't do at an individual level. Thank you. Ganesh? Sure thing. I mean, of course, I agree with everything what Vikas said. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, really important mechanisms that the university has, M cubed, as well as through Mishar, uh, Coulter Foundation, the uh, grant uh, opportunities and support mechanisms that really allow uh, these uh, early stage ideas to have some substrate to fund them before they get lost into the abyss and who knows the next cancer curing or disease curing entity or idea just may not may be able to move forward without the sort of early stage support from uh, from mechanisms like this, certainly into, uh, tech transfer and fast forward, et cetera, that we have in the medical school are all, also extraordinarily important because it's, it's taking that first idea that shows some potential and some sort of uh, possibility in the clinic, but then we don't t typically, uh, clinicians, and I dare say probably typically the scientists also, don't have the wherewithal and knowledge and the training on how to take an idea and then move it forward into a company. And we need help. And we have uh, extraordinary partners in tech transfer, as well as here at the business school, as well as outside VCs who want to come here and help us move some of these discoveries uh, to the clinic where it's extraordinarily important. I will say that these days, I think there's enormous pressure on clinicians to see patients. And uh, we, we sometimes probably don't have the opportunity to sit back and reflect to think about how can we do something better and how can we improve on what we're doing via collaboration. So that's something for me and Vikas and our partners in the medical school to think about how can we carve out time and or um, support uh, investigators and our own clinicians to kind of come together, take a break from their clinical activity, and to think together about how we can solve common problems. I do think there are lots more opportunities that are just haven't been really harvested yet because we're too busy in the daily grind of seeing patients. You guys are probably very busy in the lab and, and don't know how well you can translate your findings into helping people because we have yet to really come, to come together. So I think there's tremendous opportunities still out there that we just haven't tapped yet. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And you know, just hearing this journey, it causes me to pause and reflect on like, what if you know, at this critical moment, um, they didn't get the funding or you know, the, the team gave up. You know, once this has the impact we all hope it's gonna have and the millions of lives it would touch, just knowing that there were so many moments along the way that it might not have happened, but for, um, makes me think about all of, all of the innovations across our portfolio and what more we can be doing to support them. So just wanna, you know, I fully agree with that. Um, so, so Jim, you've got a long history of, of working with the University of Michigan. How many Celebrate Inventions have you been to? Like, like all of them. Oh. I was at the first one. I think I, Ken asked me if he thought it would be a good idea before, yeah. before, okay. before he did the first one. So then this is like your 21st. So you've been working with us for a while. Um, how have you seen the university evolve and how we're approaching our support of innovation and of our faculty inventors, our, our approach to research commercialization and tech transfer? Well, everything is faster now. You know, the first university license I did in 1997 took a year to negotiate. It was painful. I'm like, oh my God, this, this isn't so much fun. Well, we were faxing stuff back and <laughs> forth, right? True, but so everything is faster. The, the collaboration, the programs, you know, again, we mentioned Coulter and there's a whole bunch of other ones um, there. You know, Accelerate Blue um, is a great idea. We need more of, I mean, in this room, I mean, I see so many familiar faces. There's a lot of knowledge on how to do this. You know, we don't have enough money, you know, and funding for it all. So I think more, more money. I'd like to do a whole bunch of histosonics, but I have to pick the companies I invest in um, because I have a limited amount of capital. But it's the collaboration. Um, it's the time, the time to 
you know, to collaborate, not just see patients and not just be in the lab and, and getting together. Uh, because that is, as Jen, Jen said really well, that's the power of Michigan is all of these departments are top 10, is getting them to work together and getting the administration, frankly, I'll say, to get out of the way sometimes. A lot of times there's so many rules and this and that, it just slows things down. Let the inventors and the physicians work together and go fast, because there is so much great stuff here. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I, I think I want to open it up and see if there's any questions from the audience. So is there anything you're, you're dying to know? Yes. Well, you know, apply to Coulter, apply to, you know, all the different, you know, programs to, you know, get collaborators. Like, that was really important that it was engineers and the clinicians, because the engineers are doing the inventing, but the, at the end of the day, the clinicians are the, are the uh, customers. So seeing that is really important. And, you know, kind of milestones, like show, you know, early on, we treated a lot of dogs at Histosonics to prove that they could invest or they, that they could ablate it, tissues safely. And so think about how we can de-risk it, how you can you know, show that this works, it is on a path to working. Thank you. Any others from the audience? Okay. No, hearing, hearing none, I'm gonna go back to Jen. Um, so, so Jen, how has the university supported you and your team in the development of histotripsy? And, you know, what do you think as a university we could be doing better to help our faculty inventors? So um, we, we did take advantage, as Jim talked about, the culture. So that was very helpful because we were naive as uh, how do we go about it. And the, the thing about culture is not only the funding, that funded uh, the initial, the IP, the regulation path. And those are things that you can not really get funding from NIH or from a federal institute on that. So that was helpful to have some alternative funding resources that can fund things that's important to actually get so second thing is, uh, I, I feel if I go back, what I would do is I will probably start a little later. I will probably go to NIH, uh, the, uh, the STTR, those kind of mechanism to get more uh, federal money to do the early development. Because as soon as you go to gym, <laughs> go to investors, uh, you start a company, the burn rate is really fast. We have to tackle all the technical problems as much as possible, to de-risk it as much as possible. Before we go there, I, I think that would be uh, very helpful. Uh, and now, you know, we're looking at new indications such as uh, brain tumor collaboration with neurosurgery, I did the appendix, and that's, you know, things that we're thinking about, like how can we de-risk it, not going through just like, you know, prostate early on. Um, and then the third thing is uh, the, the networking. Right, so really networking, knowing the right people. So Tom Davidson just came to us by chance, and we were able to have him. There's no way I can be a good CEO, really, just no way. Uh, but having that management team with a track record experience, know who to contact, and uh, know who to reach out to, get funding, get the right team to join the company, uh, and and I feel like you know we some professors are really trying to do both. So at initially be both a CEO, CTO, and they have graduate student, that's okay at the beginning. But if you really want to grow bigger and bigger, at some time point, you kind of have to render control to professional team to do it. And I think investors, when you go to investors, the technology is important, but the team is really, really important. Jim is looking at really, you know, if your team has that experience, track record, what it takes to actually go through the whole translation. And they are looking at the clinician saying, hey, is this really viable, not just a cool technology in the lab, right? Uh, and I want to 
want to say a bad end is also we need more gym. <laughs> like we, need, we need more people. Like you know, uh, really like uh, uh, Jim was talking about. You know, 2010, a lot of up and downs, uh, and the, many times I thought we we're not gonna make it. Really, I was like really many many times. So so sitting here, and and I really want to say I'm grateful for all the investors who really believed in this technology and are willing to stick with us through not just up but a lot of downs. And now we are where we are at. Um, I'm just really, really grateful for not only the collaborations, the team we have, but also the Hisasonics Unsung Hero crews here and is in all the investors as well. And, and the tech transfer, all now innovation partnerships. <laughs> Thank you. So um, on that third point, on the importance of networking and connecting our inventors with entrepreneurs and with investors and with ecosystem partners, it's my pleasure to conclude the panel. Um, so, and then we're going to adjourn um, just down the hall to the networking reception. We're going to have technology demonstrations, music, food, drinks. So please do stick around. But before we head down, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you so much.